when you look at our performance, Andy, thanks to the comments, um, you know, I've mentioned a lot of stocks on your show that contribute to that. We don't try to hide names like so many portfolio managers do. We've mentioned a lot of our kind of on the periphery names like. John Fennec, what is going on? How are you? Hey, I'm doing good, Andy Pace. How are you today? Doing good. Really good to see you, man. It's been a little bit of a while. Um, and a lot of yeah. things are happening in the metals industry, whether they're precious metals or base metals. Let me give me a 30,000 foot view here. Gold's had a great run. So has silver. Um, we've had a little bit of a pullback here. What are your thoughts on that from now going into the end of the year? I wouldn't get worried. Um, gold, as we record this, is 2645 an ounce. Um, my target, as I've said once on your show before, was 2500 for the year. That was in January. Um, so we're up over 30% as as a commodity year to date. I mean, you know, when you see numbers like that on a trailing one year, it's almost 40%. So when you see these kind of numbers, it's really, really you know, you have to be thankful. You know, if you have physical gold, you're doing extremely well and it's hedging your portfolio. It's it's adding diversification. It's doing all the things you want it to do. But the real problem this year has been non-producing gold stocks, right? Producers have done really well, like Agnico, AEM, and a bunch of other names. Sure. But when you look at the developers and the explorers where we spend a lot of our time, there's still a tremendous opportunity as we record this right now to get alpha out of your portfolio for the year. When you look at silver, we're trading around 3115 right now and now it's um, disappointing that it failed the second time at that 3250 kind of level that we've talked about on your show. But we look for these support and resistance levels, Andy, because it keeps us on track, right? When we see something fail at 3250-ish, we're not discouraged because this is the only, only the second failure. Remember that at $30 silver, over the past decade, that failed six or seven times. So it sometimes takes a while for you to get through a, a resistance level, right? The main thing is holding support and support for silver is clearly at 26. I would argue 27 now, and you keep building a higher floor on silver. So I think, you know, we could see a channel of 27 to 28 soon be the new floor. And then, you know, it's go time. Once we break through 3250, we'll easily test 35, you know, quickly after that 3250 to 33 level is breached. John, and so I was going to ask you about um, energy, but you just said go time. So I want to talk about two things. Um, the first thing, congratulations, your portfolio is up significantly. I want you to talk to me about that. And this is a results driven business and you've given all great results so far. And the second thing is precious metals stocks that you like. If it's go time, you want to load up on your favorites. Mention to me after your uh, performance, what are some sure. favorites? Yeah, so we've been coming on your show since last year, and I probably mentioned Aftermath Silver, you know, three times, all under 20 cents. And now the stock's trading at 33 cents, right? Um, what? Why is that? Well, there's they had really positive news February 29th of this year about their manganese being 99.9% battery grade. They presented at Beaver Creek and did a nice job there in September. But one of the investors that had a huge position in Aftermath is no one other than Eric Sprott. And Eric basically called the company the following Monday on September 16th and said, I want to put another 5 million Canadian into the company. And then the stock really got a bid up to about 37 US. So, you know, you see these kind of things where a company like that, you know, two years ago, would have struggled a bit to raise two, three, four million. Now they're raising a $5 million chunk here. They did a successful finance earlier in the year. This is what you look for because now they're cashed up, right? They, they're cashed up until at least Q1. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue about that. So, so now it's just like, hey, if silver goes up, this stock has tremendous torque to the price of silver. And that's why it's our largest silver equity holding at around three and a half percent. When you look at our performance, Andy, thanks to the comments, um, you know, I've mentioned a lot of stocks on your show that contribute to that. We don't try to hide names like so many portfolio managers do. We've mentioned a lot of our kind of on the periphery names like First Tellurium. You know, what I mentioned last year, First Tellurium was less than a 1% holding for us. And as I got to know Ty and got to know the story, it's not just a mining story, it's a technology story. 
And we have a zero weighted tech in our portfolio, but I don't mind owning a mining stock that has tech as a component in a hot tech market, right? So first Tellurium, FSTTF in the States, FTEL in Canada. Um, look at the volume that thing is doing in the last couple of trading sessions. It's starting to move nicely. Um, you know, we mentioned it first on your show at around six cents last year. It's trading at 10 now all day long. Um, that's a nice gain on, on a stock that we've taken from a 1% position up to a 3.2% position. Um, another one that we've mentioned is Guardian Metal, which used to be called Golden Metal when I mentioned it last year. I know you've interviewed Oliver, uh, the CEO at least once, and we found that stock, gosh, around 14 cents. We didn't buy it until 17 or 18 cents US. It ran all the way to 52 this year. And then it pulled back. Why did it pull back? No news pulled it back. It, they had to do a financing, right? And so when you see these kind of opportunities, that financing, by the way, equates to about 35 cents US. That's why the stock's at 34 US. It's like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's pulled back based on the fact that they're raising capital. As an investor, you have to say, okay, well, I didn't buy it at 18, which I bought it, but I need to also buy it at 52, right? So I wasn't chasing it. Now you're buying it kind of in the middle. Like put an order in and buy some. It's going to go retrace to that 52 level, I think, next year. I mean, the chart's telling you that it did a lot of good volume, um, especially on the London Exchange at, at the, you know, the highest price of the year. So those are the, you know, by the way, that's, that was a 1% position last year. Now it's a 2.4% position. So you get what I'm saying. Like these names that no one's ever followed or heard of with zero analyst coverage or contributing to our performance. And that's what makes us different. Yeah, actually, and yeah, let me say this to all the viewers, uh, Guardian Metals, uh, Oliver was on the show. It was about a week ago, and they uh, have become a sponsor of uh, natural resource stocks. Um, great story. Check them out. Let's talk here um, about energy, if you would, and you cover everything. So what are your thoughts on energy, specifically oil, and then the pivot a little bit to alternative energy like uranium or anything else that you're following? Okay. Yeah, I'm not so up to speed on the day-to-day -day of energy. I follow longer trends in energy. And so what I'm seeing is, you know, Iran getting involved since their last interview, right? Uh, if their oil fields get hit um, by the Israelis, you're going to have a serious spike in oil price. I think everyone knows this. But why would you say that that's such an outlier when you're seeing the crazy action that we're seeing, right? It's very possible that that could happen within 12 months. So a broader conflict in, in, in the Middle East to me is why you buy oil and oil stocks here, but we're not going to just buy Exxon and, and call it a day. We, we get creative just like we do with, with the mining sector. Right. So we've been buying oh, just, know. yeah, we just, we mentioned this once in your show at a higher price, Anchor Resources, which is A-N-K-O-F, A-N-K in Canada. Um, you know, I started to follow this stock around seven and a half, eight cents U.S. Today it was at six and a half. Uh, seller out there all day. And I'm like, this doesn't even line up with the Canadian, you know, price. Sometimes you get this ARB trade, as you know, Andy, with your experience, where the U.S. ticker trades walking versus the Canadian ticker. And so you take advantage of those situations because you know in a day or two, it usually fixes itself. Um, but beyond that, I really like the fact that they're growing their oil revenues and they've done it consistently now for months. And again, as a micro cap, you don't get Notice sometimes by the public right away. It takes a while, but a stock like that trading at six and a half today, I think it closed at 0 0.062. I mean, easily a 50% gain, I think, from here into next year. So those are the kind of names where we have to, we have to use opportunity costs as an investor, right? You can say, well, I can buy the price of oil, which we do. Um, is that going up 50% in a Middle Eastern conflict? I don't think so. Um, I think it would go up a lot, but maybe not 50, right? A little micro cap like Dancor, if you go up 50 by accident because it's got a pretty tight flow, you know, it's got a management that believes in the story, isn't selling cheaply. Um, so, you know, we look for those little names that no one's ever heard of again. Um, and in uranium, to your point, uranium uh, has done better since we last met and we continue to hold our positions and add to certain positions. We added to forum around uh, six cents US, uh, and that one is FDCFF. Um, and again, forum, you know, drove 30 holes. since the last time we talked, right? When you see 30 drill holes being put out in a press release, you got to say to yourself, this company's going to have regular assays news coming 
from October 1st, let's call it to the end of the year. So, so that's exciting because if uranium does well, they're putting this, these results out into a hot market, right? Not a guarantee that uranium's going to do well, but you look for these things and say, okay, now it's, it's 0 0.073 us or 0 0.075. This thing hit 15 and a half last year. So again, it's trading 50% off right now of its high last year with literally a couple of good holes, not 30 being drilled. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's just, you know, your sector is very inefficient. People don't follow it as closely as they should. And that's why we spend the time talking to CEOs like Delane Weeks over at Ancora or Rick Mazur at Forum and really getting an idea of where these things are headed. Got it. So you, let's go back to critical metals and base metals. You've talked about them in the past. Uh, Offline, you were told me about critical metals. You're very, very piggy with critical metal metals um, for a lot of different reasons. And Guardian was one of the companies that you really liked, for lack of a better word, I'll, word, I'll call them a critical metal companies. Why are you so picky? And is there anything you like in the critical metal space as well as um, base metals? Uh, you've also been very picky with base metals there. What do you like? Sure. So... Just to clarify on Guardian, uh, GMTLF, you know, they, they are involved in gold, copper, other things in Nevada, right. but they're most known in the critical space for tungsten and tungsten production in the U S last year, and it was 0%, 91% of tungsten was produced in China in 2023. That's what got me most interested is that here's this little junior in Nevada run out of London. You know, with no Canadian picker, you know, so it, it doesn't trade like efficiently sometimes, which is actually good if you're in an uptrend. Um, and, and, and these are the kind of things you look for and say, what are the other names that I could buy in Tungsten? There aren't many. It's Fireweed, FWEDF, which we also own with a couple of names in North America. I'm not going to get involved in like, you know, parts of the world that are just super risky from a jurisdiction perspective, as you know. So I'm looking at, you know. Canada with Fireweed, U.S. with with something like Guardian. Moving into to base metals, you know, the nickel space, I think is extremely interesting. Most people would disagree with that. Um, but when you see a commodity down 43% last year, you have to ask yourself why. This wasn't like some little outlier commodity. This is a top 10 industrial commodity. I'd argue top five. So how how is it down 43%? We've said this before in your show, and I'll, I'll say it one more time because I don't want to beat a dead horse, but obviously nickel is being produced heavily in Russia. Russia is in a war. Russia is selling their nickel to the Chinese and others to fund the war effort, period, end of story, in my opinion. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I've heard that from many people overseas. But I'm just saying it's obvious that when you see a commodity down almost 50% in one year and it's heavily produced in a place like Russia, that something's going on behind the scenes that you and I aren't aware of. So what does that mean for investors? Well, you could buy an ETF that tracks the price of nickel, but more for us, we want to buy equities that are involved in nickel. So two names that we really like, Power Nickel, PNPNS in the States, PNPN in Canada. Been a great ride with Terry uh, since I met him last year. The stock was in a, a channel when I met him last October. Um, it broke through that channel in April this year. Um, so it took about six months, right? It, it, some of these things take a while to materialize, but then he did a financing into strength, brought in a second tranche of money from Robert Ewan, uh, uh, an initial investment from Robert Freeland, who runs Ivanhoe, the you know, the founder of Ivanhoe, um, just getting some serious people on board. And then he, you know, he, he bolstered his board with some really smart people and that deposit now is not just a nickel deposit. So their name is sort of misleading, right? And I think they will have a name change coming up in the, in the, in the next few months because I've actually talked to the company about this. Um, nickel is sort of like a dirty word the last year or two, right? So if you have that in your name, people don't understand that they're, they're, they're most of their ascent in stock prices because of their copper hits. So, you know, as a polymetallic deposit in a great jurisdiction in Canada, this is something that we really like because as that, um, as the geology unfolds over the next six, three, six, nine months, I think people in the investing world will start to see, oh, there's potential here for a lot of copper. There's potential for platinum, et cetera. Um, the other one is, is super cheap. Uh, it's got a kind of a tale of two of the stories now in the sense that, you know, 
Power Nickel has sort of done this and Stillwater has sort of done this, but Stillwater remains one of our favorite names because it's completely misunderstood. And as a value manager, you have to be patient, right? And we don't have any problem buying stock here. We bought more just last week at Stillwater at 0 0.086. Um, the ticker is PGEZF in the States, PGE in Canada. Mike does a great job leading the company. He's very grounded. Um, they're connected to a major in Montana. And I see good base for that stock in the next, you know, three to 12 months. That one I've been wrong on. I want to just add, you know, I, I've been mentioning that at higher prices, 12, 11, 10 cents. Now it's trading about eight and a half. Look, I mean, some of these things don't materialize right away. You know, um, if you looked at power and nickel, you could have easily said, Hey, I'm buying this at 20. And then it was at 16 when you blinked, you know, and you lost 15 to 20%. And then you have to decide, do I sell here? Or is this going to break support? I would argue if you look at the Stillwater chart, I mean, support is being formed as we speak. So I think it's, it's got some upside. Well, uh, two things I want to end on these. You have a conference coming up. First, you have a conference coming up in Florida that I'm a media sponsor. There I'll be interviewing some of the CEOs of the companies there, as well as yourself. Talk to us about that. And then secondly, and now answer this question first. I've made this mistake and so many investors make these mistakes. They will see a, uh, or listen to a company that you name drop or another analyst or no name will name drop and they'll just hold on to that. Why shouldn't they not do that? Why do they really need help with somebody uh, like yourself? Or if it's not you, it's somebody else. Why do they need the help? Yeah. So think of Jim Cramer, right? Jim Cramer will tell you more what he's going to buy, 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 as opposed to sell, sell, sell. Um, and when you Tell me when Jim Cramer's selling. He runs a hedge fund, right? Like you'll never know what Jim's selling until it's after the fact. And then you're going to be like, oh, I got to catch up because now there's a wave of sellers, right? Because someone found out that's way bigger than you and I. And that's the problem I have with free advice, quote unquote, whether it's mine or his or anyone else's, is that you're not getting it real time. We've developed a really interesting service, Andy, of real time updates where it's really macro driven, but the macro really drives the behavior, as you know, in our sector, right? So we were talking about the Iran, you know, aggression here just a little bit ago and saying, this is what it means for putting another floor on gold. We did the same thing when things heated up, you know, earlier this year in Israel, we did the same thing October 7th of 2023, when the initial situation happened and we try to show people, this is what this means, right? This is what non-farm payrolls means. This is what CPI means. This is what the Fed, you know, was just talking about today. We don't spell it out. You know, we have sophisticated clients so we're not going to spell it out like bit by bit by bit, but we're giving you bullet points on, you know, what this means for gold, silver, GEX, like the, the mining, you know, big ETF, or just the broad market. We talk about the S&P and NASDAQ all the time and how this can affect things, you know, that we may not even be interested in or, or like we know our clients are, right? So I think that's why people need to align with people. Also, you're not going to know like I mentioned millennial potash in your show at 13 cents, the last time we recorded, um, it's trading at 19 and a half cents now. I mean, nothing's happened. There's no news. It's literally like people have found out that this, this stock is just cheaper than they expected. And it's been on a nice ascent over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, when are you, when do you know if I'm going to sell that? If you're not a follower of mine, I'm not going to call you up and say, I'm out of millennial potash now, right? Like you have to be able to print some money out there to work with someone like myself or Rick Rule, one of your guests, you know, and, and be like, Hey guys, help me out here. I've got a portfolio of this, this, and this, this is what I focus on mostly gold and silver. Right. And I have a time horizon of this, I've got a risk tolerance of that and help me out. Now I'm not going to give you buy, sell, hold because I'm not licensed anymore. I was licensed for, you know, 25 plus years and I gave up my license voluntarily because I didn't want to get involved when, uh, stuff in writing with clients as I, as I really saw, you know, Andy, like last year when we were talking that gold was going to take off. And I think there's going to be more scrutiny around our sector, around everything gold. And so I didn't want to get in, you know, Hey, buy this gold stock and then not had to work out for someone. Right. So we, we tell people, Hey, I just met with the gold CEO from, you think of one. Um, so I was at Beaver Creek and I met with Next Gold, right? And Next Gold was telling me that they wanted to find a way to get to production earlier than 2030. Guess what? Literally a few weeks later, their news comes out that they merged with Single Gold, as you probably saw. So 
literally figured it out within four weeks of my meeting with the CEO. So did I share that information? Yeah. I said to my, my clients, Hey, look, you know, I, I had a meeting with this company and they said they want to grow production yet. They're six months, six years away from production. So it'll be interesting to see how they do that. So I said, and now we see this merger, right? And that's accretive to shareholders because they go from around three and a half million ounces of gold now to 4.7 million ounces of gold. That's a big difference. So, you know, does that answer your question or? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, I think really the answer that you gave in a roundabout way, you really need somebody to monitor this for you and give you information as it's happening um, or right after it happens so you can make you in sound investment decisions. So that's what I would say. Talk to me about Florida here. Um, again, I know all about it. I'm really looking forward to meeting you um, and meeting uh, the vendors that are there, the companies that are there. Um, tell me what you're looking for and... Um, yeah. Tell me all about it. So we did this differently this year in that, um, I really didn't solicit sponsorship money from banks, broker dealers, analysts. We really had none of these entities showing up. So, you know, if you're a company listening to this, you know, that these entities are trying to sell you something at pretty much every mining topic out there, which is, it's, it's fine. That's part of the game, right? But we're trying to connect companies with accredited investors. That's the key word is like any investor could say, I got a hundred bucks and I want to bring it to a mining stock. Like what's their time horizon? What, what's the capital that they have behind that? We're asking all of these questions of the investors so that the companies can actually gain something from attending this. And likewise, we're screening the companies hard for investors because a lot of the companies out there are crap. You know, I mean, let's be honest, they just, they, they don't have a game plan on their, on their, their presentation deck. They don't have any cash in the bank, really. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong on the company side. So we've, you know, taken the time to create a list of companies that I think is very diverse by metal. It's also diverse by capitalization. So if you're a larger investor, you know, there's, there's companies like Skeena attending, there's companies like collective mining attending, these companies are on the New York stock exchange, right? So you as a broker can buy stocks that, that, you know, fit your parameters. But if you're a little investor or someone like myself that likes the junior space a little bit more, we're going to have plenty of junior, you know, explorers and developers there that you can choose from, but we're going to do it in a, in a thoughtful way. So we have gold, silver, uranium, copper, nickel, all these types of commodities cover. Um, so I'm hoping it goes well. We'll see. Um, the, the hurricanes are behind us. We're, we're not affected by that at all in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our hearts go out to those that were affected by Milton. It was pretty awful looking. Yeah. Well, John, let's uh, end it there. I will see you in Florida. I really look forward to this and I will put all of the companies that you discuss as well as a link to your uh, conference in the show notes below. Thank you. Thank you.